something like How does Judaism as a religion look at or understand the land of Israel or the Holy Land? Or if you want, you can say Palestine. It's just the same place with different names. How does Judaism understand that? And how is that different from Zionism? So I'll try to say that kind of briefly. And. Um, Take this as my ideas. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident about my ideas. But nothing I say is like the absolute truth. Keep learning, keep asking people. You know, we say a lot if, you know, ask two Jews, you get three opinions. But I will tell you what I think as a, you know, as me. So, a relationship with the land of Israel, I'm just going to use that term because that's our term, is absolutely integral, integrated into authentic Jewish religion. I'll just say a little bit more about that to illustrate what I just said. Take that as like the topic sentence. A relationship with the land of Israel is completely integral in Judaism. So. In our story that's in the Torah, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the very first thing that God says to Avraham or Ibrahim, God says, Lech lecha mi artsacha mi molatacha mi betavicha el ha'eret asher ha'eka. Go forth, get up, leave, and go from your land, which is like, okay, this is where you're born. From the place where you were born, Molatecha, if you know Arabic, you hear the roots of being born. Molatecha, your land, your, your birthplace, your father's house. Go forth to the land that I will show you. And God doesn't even say where that is. And Ibrahim, because of his great Iman, it's like, Okay, let's go. I don't know where I'm going, but take me there. Show me. I'm, I'm on my way. And he takes his wife, and he takes other people in the household, and he goes. But my point is, where? Where did he go? And God did not take him to China, or to India, or to Russia. He went to a place at that time was called Canaan. And in Canaan, in our story, God says, I, I give this land to you and your descendants. So that's, I'm, I'm making a case that the relationship with that land is completely inherent in Judaism. I also want to just take the next step of like articulating this. What is this? So the, it's conditional. Conditional means you, you meaning Abraham, and his descendants have to live in God's ways. They have to live a godly life. They have to live a holy life. Part of that holy life is a just society. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. And many, many other very important things. And if you live in God's ways, then yes, God will give you this land. It says in the Torah, uh, actually, it says right in the Torah, don't think God is giving you this land because you're so good and you deserve it. You know, you basically have to live up to that. You have to prove it. You have to continually live that way. And you can read right in the Torah, in, in Deuteronomy, if you don't, if you fail to live in God's ways, you're out. God's going to kick you out of here, you know? And centuries later, in later parts of the Bible, not in the Torah, there are prophets. And uh, the prophets like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Micah, you know, big prophets that the Christians have also. I know Muslims also. And they were living in a time 
where they saw the society was like so corrupt. You know, that whatever, the kings were corrupt, the priests were corrupt, the rich people were oppressing the poor people. And the prophets said, you can't go on like this. God is not going to let this go on. And you might think if you make an alliance with a big empire like Egypt, or a big empire like Assyria, you know, the empire will protect you. But no, that's not going to happen because God doesn't let you stay here because of the way you're living. You're going to get kicked out into exile. And then that happened, just historically, it happened. And we today, with a kind of a secular view of things, might see geopolitical events like an empire conquering a small country as just a, a geopolitical thing. Yeah, like uh, that's what empires do. Empires conquer small countries. But the religious view of this, that comes from starting with the Torah, then the prophets, they said, listen, the geopolitical actors are God's agents. And if we got kicked out of our land, galinu mi otsenu, it's because of our sins. But the prophets didn't leave it at that. The prophets said, if you do teshuva, or for Muslims, they say tauba, come back in your heart. Come back to God. Live a godly life. God will take you back. You can go back to your land. You can live a good life in your land. And in our story, they did. But then, centuries later, in the time of the Romans, same thing happened again. Society was corrupt. In our, again, in our Talmud, we have very specific stories. How society was corrupt. What did people do? But in the end, in our religious view, God used the Romans again to like teach the Jews. You can't act like that and live in that land. Get out. <laughs> and here we are, 2,000 years later, right? I'm hanging out in Canada. So we, a Jewish religious relationship with that land is absolutely inherent. And in our prayers, you know, we have morning prayers, afternoon prayers, evening prayers, every time, every day, more than three times a day. We pray to God to be restored to that land. But being restored to the land means we're living in a holy way. Oh, and then God wants us back, right? So I'm, I'm just giving you what I believe is truly and honestly a Jewish religious perspective on relationship with that land. I could talk about that probably for another 10 hours. But let me just shift and talk about Zionism. So after centuries and centuries and centuries, maybe 2,000 years of Jews thinking that and trying to like pray, and maybe most Jews tried really hard to live a holy life. They tried to do the things they thought they should do. And still, God didn't take them back. And like I said before, they're getting killed, and their houses are being burned, and they're getting you know, knocked out of their villages, and this happened over and over and over and over again. Toward the end of the 1800s, which is less than 150 years ago, some Jews who lived in Europe saw the rise of nationalism in Europe. It was a, it was a product of mid-19th century European culture. Just to say a little bit more about this, uh, you, you know, these are things I learned as I went through my life. I don't know how many of you already know this stuff. If you don't know it, I'm happy to say it. If you do know it, you know, maybe you can uh, add to what I'm saying. But in some places, like Germany, there were many, many, many little principalities and little dukedoms, and maybe somebody had a kingdom or something. Ooh, 1848, along comes like Bismarck or somebody's like, 
No, we're all Germans. We're gonna have one country, Germany, right? Don't break it up into all these little things. Same thing in Italy, right? There's all these little Italian like states and stuff. Make that Italy, right? And then in other places, I'm, so I'm gonna try to illustrate this, like the Ottoman Empire for 800 years was a vast empire filled with many, many kinds of people. Arabs, Turks, Greeks, you know, Bosnians, you know, Armenians, many Jews, many other people, all living in this big empire. And it wasn't a nationalistic thing. I, I, I happened to go to, uh, to Cairo. I was in Egypt, and I went to see like a big, beautiful mosque. It's called the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Cairo. You're nodding, you know this place? I heard the Muhammad Ali <laughs> Okay, you heard about it? Yes. I went there. <laughs> so Muhammad Ali was, uh, an, he was an Albanian. Yes. So, you know, he's, I'm just making a point about nationalism. So they're living in the Ottoman Empire, ruled by Turks in Egypt, and the Pasha, or whatever he was, like ruling over the Egyptians for the Turks was an Albanian, and they have this big, beautiful mosque named after him. So that's very multicultural, multi-religious, multilinguistic, right? That's the Ottoman Empire. My one part of my family lived in the Habsburg Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So again, there's Jews, Romanians, Bulgarians, you know, I don't know, Hungarians, Czechs, Slovaks, right? You can make a whole list. People speaking German and all these other languages. And they're all living there together. They're all mingled and mixed up together. And that's how it was for centuries. And think about the Russian Empire, of course. There's Russians, Ukrainians, and uh, what? I don't, I don't even have this list. Many, 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 many different kinds of people, including Jews living in the Russian Empire. But my point I'm getting to, talking about Zionism, in the late 1800s, this rise of nationalism in Europe, I'll just make up something like, Romanians want their own country to be Romania. And Hungarians want their own country to be Hungary. And Poles want their own country to be Poland. And the Lithuanians want their own country to be Lithuania, right? And there were Jews that said to themselves, whoa, wait a minute, what about us? So many, many Jews went right along with the country they lived in. There were Jews in every different country, and they were like, I'm a Hungarian Jew, and I'm gonna fight for Hungary. But there were other Jews that said, no, 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 no. We need our country. And also this thing of like praying to God and trying to do what God wants. So God takes us back to our country. That's not working. We're like, we're doing that for 2,000 years and it's not working. It didn't happen, right? So forget that, right? right? Just like give that up. Hey, five minutes? Thank you. That's helpful. So very roughly and crudely, I'm describing to you the beginning of Zionism. And in the beginning of Zionism, the vast majority of Jews did not opt for that. There's different ways of living in the world. Many people held on to the traditional religious view. They stayed religious. Other Jews cast off religion and just kind of joined the big secular society. Many different things, but if the question is, kind of, how does Judaism treat this land of Israel, and how does Zionism do it, I, th I think I've given a pretty fair description of those two things. And that actually leads me right to like the next, the next thing, that one of these topics, right? I have, there's three other topics. The, the use of false accusations of anti-Semitism because people either oppose what Israel is doing in 
brutally oppressing Palestinians for 75 years, and you talk about that, you get called an anti-Semite. That is just a complete fabrication, distraction, like trying to, trying to pull people off that topic and silence them. I get called that. It's not. Anti-Semitic is a word made up by a German who hated Jews. <laughs> Anti-Semitic means hates Jews, hating Jews. It's not about Semitic people. People who speak Arabic may be Semitic, because Arabic's a Semitic language. No. People who live in Ethiopia, they're Semitic. Anti-Semitic doesn't mean against the Semitic people. This ridiculous German person living in Germany, seeing Jews, he thought, oh, they're Semites. So he made up this word, anti-Semitic. But being against Zionism is not anti-Semitic. Many, many Jews are against Zionism. Speaking the truth about what Israel's doing is not anti-Semitic. It's absolutely necessary. We all must do that. And th that leads me to the next thing I'm going to say. Saying that there should not be a Jewish state. I'm opposed to the existence of a Jewish state built on the land of other people, built literally on their graves and the rubble of their homes, and excluding them and oppressing them. No, there should not be a Jewish state. Now, what I just did is actually criminalized because, according to certain laws that have recently been adopted in Canada, that's hate speech because, supposedly, I just deny the right of the Jewish people to national self-determination. And if I deny the right of the Jewish people to national self-determination, well, that's anti-Semitic, and that's illegal. Right? So all of that, what I just said, I'm kind of mocking it, that's a completely made-up, fabricated thing. The idea that there is a right to national self-determination. Let's ask the Hoden Sonnies, how's that working out for them? Yeah. Let's ask the Anishinaabeg people. Oh, are they exercising their right of national determination? Hmm, I don't think so. Go to any country in Africa. Go to Kenya, ask the Luos, ask the Kikuyus. Go to Nigeria, ask the Arubas. No, that's a completely made up thing. Those nationalists in Europe, cool, that's what they're into, they created that concept. There's a right to national self-determination. That's a completely made up thing. I don't care whether it was adopted by the United Nations as part of the Universal Declaration of this and that and other things. It's made up, it's not true. And even if it was true, Jews have no right to invade someone else's country, kick them out, destroy their homes, and take it over. So I took care of that topic. What was the last topic? <laughs> I think <laughs> we just need to save some time for that. Oh, okay. Speak. I'll, leave, so. I'll leave one for next time. No, no, if you need you to know what? You know what? I actually made a note to myself because I knew yeah. I wouldn't remember it. Where's that little teeny piece of paper? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, the last, the last term that you mentioned in the beginning here was indigeneity. So that's another word that is completely misused in the Zionist rhetoric or Zionist discourse about the relationship between Jews and the land of Israel. I also want to tell you, I would say until maybe five years ago, I never even heard that term. But the claim that Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel is based on a misunderstanding of the word indigeneity. Indigeneity does not mean that your ancestors lived there a long, 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 long time ago. Indigeneity, you can just look this up in whatever political science books, anthropology books, I just do what I did with Google. Oh, what is indigeneity, actually? So indigeneity is it's a term that comes up 
in the discussion of colonization. And when a people come from somewhere else and take over the land of someone who lives there, those people are indigenous. They are living there. That's their home. They're farming those fields, right? They're pruning those fruit trees. That's where they have their houses. And somebody else came in and is trying to get rid of them. That's indigenous. So you heard me already say, the Jewish people are descended from people who lived in that land for centuries and centuries. Our kings lived there. Our prophets lived there. All the common people. I totally believe, like, if I go back far enough, yeah, my ancestors lived there. But that was 2,000 years ago. And some Jews came there within the last 100 or 120 years and started displacing the people who lived there. In this conversation about Palestine and Israel, the Palestinians are indigenous. And I just say, like, don't let anybody confuse you about that. So with that, <laughs> thank you for your uh, kind attention. <laughs>